All right. Well, uh, welcome, everybody. This is the last session of today, Wednesday, so I'm standing between you and beers, which is never a good idea. So uh, Chris and I are going to talk to you a bit today about uh, Nova Scheduler. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work in Nova over the past number of years. We're going to really be focused in on uh, optimizing, configuring, and how to deploy NFV VNFs on OpenStack. And, uh, you know, we've been, uh, we've been working on OpenStack for probably the last four years. Um, my name is Ian Jolliffe, and I'm product architect for Wind River's Titanium Cloud product. I actually live in Ottawa, Canada, which is a short one-hour flight away from here. And, uh, you know, I'm really happy to be talking to you guys today about uh, what we've been doing uh, with Nova. And this is Chris Friesen. I'm a senior member of the technical staff at Wind River, and I contribute uh, upstream mostly in the area of Nova. All right. Thanks, Chris. So uh, just a quick blurb about uh, who Wind River is. Um, we've actually got uh, our technology in all sorts of devices, from very small devices on the planet, but also off the planet. Uh, we actually have some software that runs on the, on the or ran on the Mars rover. And uh, we have uh, automotive solutions, uh, networking solutions, and telecom cloud solutions, which is our, our titanium cloud product. We've been working in uh, this te telecom industry and really since the early days of NFE, and it's amazing how far it's come so quickly. I think it's got a long way to go yet, but uh, you know, we've really been focused on solving problems that are critical to, to telecom, looking at uh, IoT applications, uh, network appliances. Uh, we've done a lot of work with uh, radio access node and CRAN technologies. Uh, certainly seen a lot of interest this week about uh, edge technologies and uh, virtual cu customer premises equipment and uh, starting to do some work on uh, mobile edge or multi-access uh, edge computing. So uh, a huge challenging and diverse array of applications that have a really unique set of uh, uh, requirements that, uh, you know, when people were starting to work with OpenStack originally, they never really envisaged any of these workloads. It was really focused on uh, pure uh, cloud native applications. So, you know, really our, our Titanium Cloud product is focused on private cloud for critical infrastructure. So let's talk about what we've been doing with OpenStack and uh, Nova. And the main focus of today's talk is really all about predictable performance and how do you get that for NFV applications. And so, you know, the way that uh, trains can run, high-speed trains can run today is just amazing and they run on time with pre uh, extreme predictability at very high speeds. So what we're going to cover today is really uh, the requirements of a typical NFE application. Uh, we're going to dig into a little bit about how the Nova scheduler works. It's a very capable scheduler, but also very complex. So there's lots of uh, tuning parameters that you can leverage and uh, helps you get out of some pretty uh, sticky situations. And so we're going to show you how to uh, maximize those uh, performance dimensions. And uh, we've actually got some benchmarks uh, that are relatively easy to digest and uh, give some people some interesting things to think about as we go through uh, the talk today. So uh, let's do a quick review. You know, probably most of the people in this room have a different set of uh, requirements for NFV applications, but I thought I'd pick off some of the uh, high-level ones. Um, you know, really we're talking about uh, deterministic network throughput and latency. So, you know, uh, typically in an F NFV application, you need a vSwitch that is uh, DPDK-based. Uh, a kernel-based vSwitch probably won't get you the throughput that you're looking for. Um, packet latencies below 50 microseconds, and also maybe even a specialized uh, compute profile for ultra-low latency. Certainly, uh, I saw a really good talk yesterday uh, from some folks that were really talking about how to get uh, uh, RT uh, performance on, uh, on Linux and uh, how to use that in an OpenStack environment. So that was a really good talk. Another key dimension is uh, predictable access to CPU performance and also the same thing for memory. So how do you get predi predictable access to the memory that you have on the, on the, on the servers? You know, these servers are, that we're seeing in uh, telecom applications are typically uh, dual Xeon. Uh, you got two NUMA nodes, you got memory split across those NUMA nodes, and 
there's a lot going on and you have to understand a little bit about the hardware topology uh, when you're uh, trying to get the best performance out of your uh, application. Also see a lot of uh, apps that are running, you know, very large number of uh, vCPUs and how do you manage that and how do you actually uh, uh, get uh, access to those cores in a predictable way. Uh, luckily, most applications are running Linux in the guest, and so that, that's at least one common baseline. So let's talk a little bit about the performance issues and some of the solutions, and then we'll um, move into the benchmarking. So uh, Intel has been doing some really good work upstream, and we've, we've contributed to some of this as well uh, around enhanced platform awareness. So uh, the EPA solutions allow you to have a better awareness of uh, a NUMA topology. So again, if you've got to a dual socket solution, uh, you can uh, leverage some of the NUMA uh, visibility. Also, uh, memory requirements for uh, uh, huge pages. Also, NIC, uh, NIC support. So being able to uh, align your NICs and your NUMA and, uh, and your workload. So uh, another really great uh, uh, technology uh, that people have been able to leverage. Um, also, uh, with PCI pass-through and uh, uh, being able to host um, acceleration engines, uh, typically uh, for encryption, like Coletto Creek from Intel. Um, and uh, people are also using that same technology for GPUs, for some uh, uh, machine learning applications. And lastly, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, hyperthreading and how uh, that impacts your performance. So really, all these things allow you to configure your application uh, and your flavors uh, using extra specs uh, for the best performance. And you know, these are some of, the, some of the tools that you have in your toolbox to be able to leverage and configure your, your flavors and make sure once you've de uh, developed your application, done the tuning, done a bit of testing, you can then uh, predictably deploy your application on a cloud and get access to all these uh, technologies that are available to, uh, to the applications. So drilling down a level, um, you know, PCI and uh, network contention is a, a critical problem. So uh, in a dual socket solution, each PCI bus is connected to uh, a specific uh, NUMA zone. And uh, so you really need to know which PCI buses are connected to which NUMA. And in the scheduler, you can actually leverage that and uh, get access to make sure that you can uh, distinguish which PCI buses you need to attach to. One learning that we uh, learned a long time ago is really uh, you want to be very careful about crossing uh, the QPI bus. Chris will show some data on that a little bit later. Uh, so we really want to make sure that if you have a high performance application, that that virtual machine is on the same NUMA node as the vSwitch and also the NIC. And with uh, some of the scheduler extra specs, you can, you can actually get that in a predictable, predictable way, which is just fantastic. Um, also, a lot of people are using solutions where they're not leveraging a, a virtual switch. And they, uh, they configure PCI pass-through or SROV. Uh, but sometimes they forget that, oh, I've placed my workload on the opposite NUMA, and that has an impact on performance. So if you want the best performance, even when using PCI pass-through and SROV, you want to make sure that uh, your VM shows up on that, the correct NUMA node. And also, uh, network contention, fairly obvious. It's a good systems engineering practice to make sure that uh, you have uh, the, the network bandwidth available to your applications. But at the end of the day, all the instances on one host will, will still leverage the same host NIC. So again, uh, being able to uh, uh, have enough bandwidth out of your box is absolutely critical as well. So we, uh, we've done a, a fair amount of benchmarking on different uh, NIC types. Um, emulated NICs like the E1000 are, are slow. Um, certainly the next layer up is uh, para-virtualized NICs like uh, Vert.io, and so that gives you uh, a next boost up, and then uh, PCI pass-through and SROV gives you direct access from the NIC into the VM, and uh, that that uh, comes at uh, a cost, though, because you need to have the right driver in the guest. Um, you still have to manage interrupts. You still have to manage the security. You don't have any firewall uh, 
which you may have on your on your virtual switch, and uh, you know it it, come, it brings a little extra burden to uh, it, to that virtual machine. Um, that if you were using a virtual switching technology, you could actually uh, uh, avoid some of that overhead. And lastly, uh, since you are tied to a physical instance, you can't actually live migrate your uh, VM from one host to another. So. Um, We've been doing a lot of work upstream to uh, try and make SROV easier to consume. Uh, we're pretty happy with where we've gotten it to, but it's still uh, more complex to configure than, I, than we would like, so we're, we're continuing to move the yardsticks forward there, so uh, looking forward to more, uh, more progress in the community for that. And lastly, for uh, DPDK-based guests, that really gives you uh, the highest performance, uh, most flexibility, um, you know, uh, DPDK has a rich set of uh, drivers that you can use, pull mode drivers, and this gives you uh, the ability to uh, uh, deploy very high performance data path applications. And you know, DPDK is a, a great technology that uh, we've been working with for a, a lo long, long time. Um, one of the downsides though is since uh, your app is running a tight, tight loop, you're gonna draw more power. So. It's engineering, so you, there's always a trade-off. So I'm going to talk about uh, memory contention ne next. Um, so, you know, by default, uh, uh, the memory is uh, configured with uh, 4K uh, pages. So um, that can run in if you have very high demands on uh, on your memory. Um, the TLB cache hits can go down considerably, and uh, that's how OpenStack is configured by default. So if you have very high uh, memory, um, memory requirements, uh, memory bandwidth requirements, you probably want to configure um, for huge pages. And Chris is going to show some data on uh, the different huge page sizes and the various impacts on performance as well. So this really, uh, and when you configure uh, huge pages, you actually uh, turn off memory overcommit by default because you're pre-allocating all the memory uh, huge pages uh, ahead of time, and uh, we've shown here uh, some of the uh, commands that you can use to uh, actually set that up on, on uh, OpenStack. Um, again, uh, since NUMA is at play here in a dual socket solution, uh, your memory will be split across both uh, NUMA zones, and so if, you're, if you allocate memory that has crossed the NUMA zone, you will take a hit uh, from crossing uh, the NUMA topology as well. But by the same token, if you have a guest that needs more memory than can be satisfied with one physical socket, you can spread your guest across multiple NUMA nodes in order to access uh, memory from both sockets at the same time. The downside of that is that when a scheduler is looking for a host to place that instance, you then need a host that has room on both of the NUMA nodes simultaneously. Yeah, that's so a great it, point. So it limits the scheduler options a little bit. Yeah, super. Thanks for that. Yeah, sure. So the question was whether or not splitting the memory across the NUMA nodes would result in splitting the CPUs across the NUMA node. Um, you can leave it up to the, the Nova um, code to do that split for you, and it will just split it right down the middle automatically. You can also explicitly state what, how much memory and which CPUs you want to be in which guest NUMA node, and Nova has the ability to, to let you get right down into the fine-grained detail about how you want to split it up yourself. But typically, you want to have the CPUs doing the work on the same NUMA node as the memory that they're accessing. Yes? In the current implementation, upstream implementation, can users specify can the new one associated with the host new So the question was, can you specify the guest new node with the host new node? Right now in upstream, you cannot do an explicit um, mapping but you can specify, I want a guest with this many NUMA nodes and this much memory on each of the NUMA nodes. But you can't say, I want guest NUMA node one to map to host NUMA node one. That, that level is not there. Yeah, so that's uh, basically become a very challenging, another thing you mentioned, the TPI uh, 
So, so, by def so the question was about the PCI being associated with one of the Newman nodes. By default, Nova will try to put, if you're doing PCI pass-through, and if your PCI device reports what Newman node it's on, by default, Nova will put the instance on the same host Numa node as the PCI device that's being passed through. Um, this can actually cause problems in that right now it's very strict about that. And if you have an application that doesn't actually care to be that strict, there's right now no way to tell it, like just give me the PCI device even if it means crossing the Numa boundary. So there's, uh, there was a spec upstream that didn't make it into to this release. But uh, they're trying to add some of that flexibility in there. Okay. Thanks for the questions, guys. All right. So uh, Chris is, uh, as you can tell, a uh, Nova and uh, CPU expert. So Chris is going to walk you through some of the CPU stuff. All right. So by default, uh, upstream Nova will give you 16 times overcommit on CPUs. So this is legacy from very early days, sort of typical um, batch jobs for, for web stuff. Um, if you care about performance, this is probably not your best bet because you're allowed to have up to 16 virtual CPUs running on the same host CPU. If they're all trying to do something at the same time, you get like 7% of, of your actual real CPU. So if you want to if you want to get better performance, you need to reduce the overcommit value. You can set this either on a, on a per compute node basis or in newish versions of OpenStack, you can set it on a per host aggregate basis. And so you could reduce your overcommit down to something a little bit more reasonable. If you really care about ultimate performance, then you want to make sure that each of your uh, host CPUs is basically owned by a single guest CPU. So this means that you would, uh, you would set the flavor extra spec or the image properties. You would set the CPU policy to dedicated. And when you do this, each guest VC, vCPU is associated with a single host CPU. And it gets exclusive access for that host CPU so that nothing else is allowed to run on it. This will completely disable overcommit, obviously. It also reduces the host scheduling overhead because that virtual CPU thread is basically the only thing running on the host CPU. And so the, the kernel scheduler on the host has less work to do because there's nothing else that's trying to run there. The one cat, or there's a couple of caveats with this. The first is that if you are using dedicated CPUs, you cannot put dedicated uh, guests with dedicated CPUs and guests with shared CPUs on the same compute node. The accounting is not there to handle that right now. So generally, the way that you would do this is by grouping your compute, or yeah, grouping your compute nodes via host aggregates. And then in the flavor, you can specify whether you want the host aggregate for shared CPUs or for dedicated CPUs. Um, the other caveat is that right now in the upstream Nova code, if you have dedicated CPUs, live migration is not guaranteed to work properly. So it will often appear to work, but you can end up where your guests are actually running on the same host CPUs as other guests. And so there are, there are some patches that have been in the works for actually a couple of years now where they're trying to fix this up and, and get the resource tracking working properly. There are, uh, it, it's a technically very tricky problem because you basically have to recalculate all of your resources on the destination side in order to make sure that you get appropriate resources allocated for you. And then you have to adjust your, your libvirt XML on the fly prior to doing the live migration. So it is a little bit tricky. Um, the, the patches have been in review for a while, but it's taking a long time to get them in. A quick question. Yes. So, so, like the CPU policy dedicated, right? Yes. So if you don't specify, so the question was, yeah, so the question was, um, if you don't specify the dedicated policy, what happens? Okay. Okay. So 
the question was, if you launch it without specifying anything and then manually go and pin it. So if you do that, there is nothing stopping the, the other instances from ending up on the same one. Now, if you, if you go in and afterwards and manually pin everything and then never change it around, then that will basically give you the same kind of, of effect in the end. But it means that you've got a lot of manual work to do. And I mean, the whole benefit of having cloud is that it's really easy to, to launch new instances and kill them. So if you're going in and manually adjusting things all the time, it, it means that you lose a lot of the benefit of cloud. Essentially, yeah, because when you specify dedicated, what's happening behind the scenes is that Nova is picking a CPU and is telling your hypervisor, I want to run this virtual CPU on this physical host CPU. So it's using the same underlying hypervisor mechanisms as you would use if you just manually pinned it. It's just doing it automatically for you. Yeah. And, and it's making sure that nobody else is, is running on it at the same time. And it makes it repeatable as well. You define it in the, extra, in the flavor, and then that, that right. flavor is defined forever. And, and so right now, if you, if you set it as, de as dedicated, you can do cold migrations and resizes and evacuates, and it will be properly handled for you. It's just the live migrations that are problematic currently. And, and the live migrations are also problematic for huge pages as well. So anything that results in a, in a NUMA topology for your guest uh, potentially can cause live migrations to behave um, unreliably. Next slide. So we've talked about, uh, about multiple guests um, contending over physical cores. Um, the next set is, is when you have multiple guests contending over separate threads of the same core. So if you have hyperthreading enabled on your host, each of the two or each of the cores is exposed as more than more than one thread. So typically now it would be two threads. And application performance is maximized when you have a single guest running on each host physical core. So generally speaking, you do not want different guests running on hyperthread siblings of the same physical core. It's likely to cause performance problems, as we will see a little bit later when I show the benchmark results. In most cases, your application performance will be maximized when you have a single guest vCPU per host physical core. So, to get this behavior, you would set the CPU thread policy to isolate. And this will reserve any other siblings from that host core and make sure that they stay idle, that nobody else is allowed to use them. So you, you basically get the entire physical core associated with one virtual CPU. In some cases, the application performance can benefit from running on hyperthread siblings. So if you have multiple vCPUs in the guest, they get put onto siblings of the same host core. Uh, this, there is a couple of reasons why this could give you better performance. You could benefit from the fact that those two siblings share a cache. Uh, it could improve your efficiency of the underlying pipeline. So you could have more virtual CPUs in your guest, but because they're using siblings, uh, they're, they're, because they are siblings of the same host cores, they can give you more overall throughput for the same number of host cores. If you want to try this out, you can set the CPU thread policy to require, and this will tell Nova to ensure that all of the vCPUs from your guest are placed on siblings of the same host core. It does require that your guest is set up with a number of vCPUs that is a multiple of the number of siblings per core. I suggest if you go this route, you probably want to actually test it and make sure that you get the performance increase that you're hoping for. Um, there's a third option, if we, if we just go, yeah. So there's a third option other than this, which is the default, which is prefer. And so Nova will try to give it to you if it can. And if it can't, then it doesn't guarantee any particular kind of behavior. So I would suggest avoiding prefer. If you care about performance, you should probably set one or the other in order to get predictable deterministic performance. Yes?
Yes. So it, it depends, uh, prefer is different. So prefer will try to give you require, but if it can't, then it will fall back to whatever it can give you. It could be all over the place. So try, I would recommend that you pick one or the other in order to get predictable performance. Yeah. So what you are getting by enabling hyperthreading is that if you have other applications that do not require the isolation because they are not as performance sensitive, they can still run on, on multiple siblings of that same compute node, whereas if you disable it completely, then you just get that many cores, and, and so you can potentially end up being able to put, you won't be able to put as much um, work onto that compute node. So by allowing you to specify isolate, you get essentially the same performance that you would if you disabled hyperthread at the host level, but it gives you the flexibility to pack work more densely if it's not performance sensitive. So the next thing I'd like to talk about is CPU cycle stealing by the host. There's a couple of reasons why you may do this. So basically this is where the guest is trying to do work and for whatever reason, the host has decided that it wants to do something on those CPUs. So the first reason why this might happen is a, a system management interrupt, and this can uh, cause significant latency spikes. This is where the BIOS on the host decides that it needs to run some work on that CPU, and so it basically interrupts everything that's running, including the host OS, to do whatever it thinks it needs to do at that point. So you may be able to avoid this by tweaking the BIOS. In the worst case, you may actually have to select different hardware if the, if the hardware is particularly badly behaved. The other reason why you might get CPU cycle stealing is host processes or kernel threads that are wanting to run on the, the host CPUs where the guests are running. It's possible in Nova to dedicate specific CPUs to host management and then reserve the rest for the instances. So there's an option in nova.conf that you can set called vCPU pin set. And this is the set of host CPUs that you want to run the instances on. So anything that's not listed, any CPUs not listed in that set are ones that you are reserving for the host itself, either for running networking or, or overall management functions or like Nova Compute itself. There are another uh, set of kernel boot args that can help you with isolating all of the, the standard Linux functions and keeping them from running on the, the CPUs where the guests will be running. So ISOL CPUs tells, it to, tells the scheduler not to place anything there automatically. You have to explicitly place it there. Uh, RC, RCU no CBs is related to the RCU callbacks. No hertz full turns off the timer tick so that there's a, you don't have the regular timer tick interrupting the guests periodically. And generally, you would match these so that they're set to the same CPU set as you specified in vCPU pin set. So this is an example of CPU cycle stealing in practice. If we look down here, I know it's really tiny, but what we're seeing is top running on the host end up in the guest. And so we have four instances of KVM, each of which is running on the same host core. So they're all contending against each other. And we can see that each of them has 25% of that core. So they've all got a CPU hog running in them. They're all trying to get as much time as they can. They're each getting 25%. If we move to the next up in the guest, we can see that top is showing 25% roughly for the CPU hog in the guest, which is what we would expect. And if we move up to the top, on the upper right, there's a ST number, and this is the steal time. So what this is showing is that 70% of the time has been stolen from this guest by the host for other purposes. So in this case, the other purposes are the other guests that are trying to run on the same host core. 
So this is time that the guest was trying to use the CPU, but the host stole it from that particular guest because other things were going on. So next we'll move to some of the actual practical benchmarks. This is the test topology that we're using. So this is kind of a, a standard compute node. We have two NUMA nodes, each of which has one processor and a certain amount of memory associated with it. We have our maintenance running on core zero over here on NUMA node zero. And we have our networking vSwitch running on cores one and two. We put some VMs in various positions within the, the two different nodes depending on the test. The red, uh, the red lines on that previous one are, are showing the logical network path between the two. So the, the test itself was pretty straightforward. We have each of the instances has two vCPUs. They are dedicated CPUs. They've got the isolate CPU thread policy that we talked about, and they're running a basic CentOS 7 image. In all cases, vSwitch is running on two host CPUs on host NUMA node zero, and it's a really simple iPerf test where one of the VMs is acting as a server and the other VM acts as a client, and it just does a simple, straightforward, unidirectional traffic dump and measures how fast it can transmit data. So in the first case, we have, uh, we, have four ca uh, we have two meg huge pages set, and we start out with the E1000 VIF model, and the only change that we make is to change to the VertIO VIF model. And that one change gives you four times the throughput that you had before. So as you can imagine, you want to avoid emulated hardware if at all possible. This is the benefits of using a para-virtualized network driver. Next one. So in this case, we start out with VertIO, because we learned something from the previous one. And we start out with 4K pages, and we move and we just change it to 2 meg pages. That's the only change that's being made. The result is, over four times faster. We change the, huge, the page size again from two meg pages up to one gig pages, and there was essentially no performance change. So the key takeaway here is two meg is the sweet spot for your memory size. Yeah, I wasn't expecting that result, <laughs> but uh, that was really interesting uh, to find out. So this test we use for learning from the previous two, we use 2 meg pages, we use VertIO, and we start off with the picture that you see here, where the two VMs are on the other NUMA node from where vSwitch is. So all of the traffic is actually crossing the QPI bus between the NUMA nodes twice. So it crosses over the bus to go to vSwitch, and then it crosses over the bus again to get back to your destination uh, virtual machine. And if we move those VMs over onto the same NUMA node as vSwitch, you get just about twice the throughput. So this shows you just the overhead, the cost of crossing over the NUMA between your NUMA zones. It's a significant overhead. So the takeaway is that you want to minimize the cross NUMA traffic as much as you can. So what you, would, what you would generally want to do is if you have vSwitch on one side, if we could go back, yeah. So if so we have vSwitch on one side, you want to pack your, your throughput sensitive applications on the same NUMA node as the vSwitch. And then if you have other you know, management functions that don't need the high level or the same kind of high level of throughput, you can pack them over on the, the other NUMA node. Or you can put vSwitch on the other one. There is a caveat there in that right now um, it is very difficult to ensure that you get placed on a vSwitch that is on the same uh, NUMA node as the destination, like as the, as the provider network that you want to connect to. 
So there's some work that could be done in Nova to, to improve some of that. Plus, if you, but in this case, it's only the both VMs are on the same computer. Yes. Yes, absolutely, yeah, yep. Yeah, so the, the comment was that in this case, they're both on the same compute nodes. So if they're on different compute nodes, you still need to worry about your NIC being on the same NUMA node as the vSwitch. All right, I think he's turning the mic on. Uh, just um, from this particular case, you're using some the traffic that you're using, you're simulating traffic on, is, is there any ability to like, do a mix on the sizing? Does that have any effect? Because obviously when we, we go throughput to the NIC with small packets, we get much different performance levels. If we go to huge, large packets, obviously we see some much difference there. Yeah, so in, I mean, this is a really simplistic case. So obviously, yeah, you can, you can make it arbitrarily complicated. So I, I just ran the simple case for this one. Well, I guess what I'm trying to do is, there was a discussion yesterday where we were talking about performance capabilities and how we get a library. So you did some testing here, which is great. And you've got some performance metrics. You're sharing it, which is great. But as we go forward and we try to do this, each time we do something new in OpenStack, sometimes we reinvent what we already invented right. before. Um, and being able to understand, okay, can we share this out? Is there a way to, let's say, test and automate this, keep it, bring it back to a central area so people can learn from it as they start to modify new systems, right? I think a test like this would be simple enough that you could actually run it in infra. I mean, it's just iperf. It's just like it doesn't need anything fancy. If you were going to start getting into PCI pass-through, there's a, a serious limitation on upstream testing involving multi-node and pass-through and, and anything that requires real hardware. So it is a, a bit of a tricky problem. Okay. But, but I think you're also proposing um, maybe some data based on varying packet sizes and, you know, from small to larger packets. So small yeah, to we did whatever whatever we can have whatever we can get as as a data set so that right. you don't go back and reinvent it each time you do a deployment. Right. So Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Okay, so are you familiar with the OPNFV yard yardstick? And Visperf, so they have several benchmarking tools and tests and uh, Lately, we augmented also for SRIV testing, so it was contributed. So that may be like a, no need to reinvent the test. And yeah, that's really great. goes through all the packet sizes. So Yardstick and uh, VSPerf, uh, is that running in a Pharos Fer lab as well? No, okay, great. I'll, I'll look into that for sure. That sounds good. I think we're on to the next slide. Okay. So this one maybe takes a little bit of explanation. So previously we were showing the individual cores on the, the different compute nodes. In this case, the cores have been broken out into the hyperthread siblings. So we have two thread siblings for each core. And as we can see, the two VMs are running on siblings of the same cores, so they're basically competing with each other for the resources of the physical cores. And so when we run the same test on this case, the performance drops by about 37%. So that shows the, the cost of uh, contention between the, the two VMs that are running on the different siblings of the same core. And the reason why we see this is obviously that, that the, the back end of the core only has the one execution pipeline. And so it does not have enough resources to keep both of the siblings running at full speed. So when they're both trying to access those resources, there will be a slowdown. Yeah, that's a really good point, Chris. Both threads in this case are really busy. So yes. you know, the benefits of hyperthreading don't come through. Whereas if you had, maybe if you'd done a test where one thread was you know, very busy and the other one was less busy, you could actually see a performance increase, right? right? Yep. Yeah, okay, great. All right, so uh, in summary, you know, we talked about some of the requirements, they're very stringent and, 
you know, Chris did a great job of walking us through some of the uh, performance uh, benefits that we saw. Uh, CPU isolation uh, gives you a 16x uh, performance improvement just because you're getting dedicated access to those CPUs. Uh, using uh, huge pages gives you a 4x uh, performance boost. Uh, making sure you're using uh, Vert IO, for example, gives you another 4, 4x improvement. And then uh, NUMA, NUMA zone awareness can give you up to a, a 2x improvement. So, you know, our tests here for today's discussion were all done independently. Um, but when you're doing your systems engineering and your analysis, you could actually run into a bottleneck that, uh, or have a set of configurations that, that could uh, result in a bottleneck elsewhere, and you won't see this kind of uh, boost. So, you know, when you start moving all these factors together, you have to make sure that you do a bit of testing to make sure that you've not uh, run into or inadvertently introduced a bottleneck uh, that, that you may not have uh, anticipated. And you know, for NFE adoption, I think predictable performance is one of the key, uh, key things. And uh, you know, we're, we're working a lot on uh, in uh, OPNFE as well as in uh, uh, NOVA in particular and SROV to help, help move that forward. Um, We've done a little bit of work on storage. It wasn't ready to present at this summit. Um, we're going to keep working on that, and I, we're going to. Chris and I will propose another talk for a future summit to talk about some of the considerations for storage performance as well. And lastly, uh, we have another talk tomorrow afternoon, uh, which is really taking it down to a, another la uh, level, and we'll be t talking about what happens under the covers with Nova when you boot an instance and and how some of these scheduler things actually work. So. That's at uh, 410. I think that's, again, the very last session of the, of the summit. So uh, I don't know how we managed to get to end of day uh, talks, but hey, that's what it is. Anyway, thanks everybody for your time. Yeah, absolutely, please. Yeah, just a question about this very virtual SNIC. So I mean, done testing with Vertio. Yes. But if you compare Vertio with some other, like, uh, what is this, um, with some other, I mean, with some, you know, some other sort of a, either proprietary or this uh, shared memory uh, mix between a virtual machine and the host. The performance can be, can be much better. Yep. So do you see any future about like, you know, replacing the Vertio model with something else which is more performance, performant? Because it looks like that is actually the, the bottleneck at the moment. Yeah, I, I think some of the really promising technology is uh, vhost uh, user as a backing and uh, that that really boosts, uh, I don't have the data to share today, but uh, we've done some experimental work uh, in that area and uh, vhost user can, uh, backed, uh, backing uh, vert.io can give you a, a very significant uh, boost uh, with, when you're using a DPDK based vSwitch as well. So I, that's the promising technology I see uh, coming down the pipe. So that would allow us to keep uh, Vert IO because it, it uh, gives you yeah. such a nice uh, performance. Yeah, I was just thinking about sort of throwing the Vert IO away yeah, completely. Yeah, that's, that's an option. That I don't have one off the top of my head that so I could say, yeah, we could switch to that. So we, I mean, we have done a bit of work with DPDK in the guest. And so, so you're basically shipping memory directly up into the guest and then processing it with a Pulmo driver and DPDK. So it, I mean, it, it does get you a lot of performance, but having Vert.io does give you a lot of flexibility. So if you can get the performance that you need with Vert.io, it, it's a better route than trying to go all proprietary. Um, I, I think usually, I mean, the, the, the usual rules apply, right, is, is try and get it working first and then see where the pain points are. So optimizing prematurely is maybe not the best path. Just as a, as a data point for, for the Vert.io numbers that we're getting here, we're talking about like 25 to 30 gigabit per second. So that's the, the overall numbers that we're talking about, and that's with Vert.io. So it's, it's reasonably respectable. Any other questions? So are you going to publish these findings? I think we just did, yes. Yeah, so. <laughs> Um, I hadn't really thought about that, but uh, yeah, the talk itself will go up on the summit yeah. website, I believe. Yeah, so. but uh, you know, I think uh, 
if, if there'd be interest, we'd be happy to do that, yeah. Any other questions? Well, it's, uh, it's getting close to, uh, well, it's past 6 p.m., so uh, <laughs> thanks everybody for sticking in, appreciate it.